I brought some materials with me, I'm going to show you, which may or may not be the future. We'll see. The brick. It's, we're not done yet with the brick. You'll be glad to know. Some of you might. Yeah, uh, let me just. Okay. Up there for a minute. Okay. Um, hopefully, this is going to work. Um, thanks very much for inviting me to speak on uh, materials. And with the setting of the future, it's something very close to my heart. And I'm, I'm going to start off with a, a view of the future from the 1950s in the form of a film. Um, and just to sort of set the scene, I mean, clearly, the stuff I'm talking about is everything, everything that we've made, I suppose. This is the man-made world, clothes, podiums, the, the polypropylene or polycarbonate seat that you're sitting on now. <laughs> got a nice combination, actually, of elasticity and, yeah, hardness. It'll stand the stead of, you know, it'll stand time for 20 years. Um, these walls, this dome, the lights, the filaments, everything, right? So we've made this incredible world, this, and this is who we are. I mean, part of being human is to make new materials, is to remake our world. And obviously, the ages of civilization are named after materials, right? So we have the Stone Age, Copper Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, and so on. So, so this, this subject is something that always does bring a new horizon in. And um, in the 1950s, there was a film called The Man in the White Suit. I don't know if you remember this. I mean, uh, those of you of a certain age will have gone to the cinema to see this. <laughs> um, those of you who haven't seen this film, it's really worth looking up. And the premise of the film is this. You've got a scientist, a material scientist, who's working in the textile industry in Manchester, and he invents a new material and basically, you can't break this material. So it's a fiber. You can make a suit out of it. It can't be broken. And it can't get dirty. And he goes to the management of the textile organization that he's in and says, this is great. This is going to completely revolutionize this industry. People are only going to need a couple of suits, a couple of jumpers, pants in their life, because these things are going to last forever, and they're never going to get dirty. And their response is to try and close down this invention as soon as possible, try and really put a foot on it. And he's incredibly surprised, you know, naive scientist. Um, so then he goes to the unions, and he says to the unions, you know what, all this work you do, it's going to be history. Soon, my material, everyone's going to have a few suits, a few pairs of trousers, a few pairs of pants for the rest of their life. You won't need any of these textile mills. And of course, they all want to kill him, basically. So, this is always the conundrum with new materials. They, they come along, and they sweep away certain bits of the status quo, let's say. The economic status quo, the familiar in terms of what you're used to wearing and your life uh, and, and what we make stuff out of. And it, it urges in a new future, which is uncertain and is often promoted as being much, much better. But for, but for who? That's the big question. And, and, and no new material comes without this baggage. So although this is a 1950s film, if you watch it, you'll see that the themes are exactly relevant today. Virtually nothing's changed, except Alice Guinness has got older, but he's still pretty cool. Um, OK, so I want to now sort of use an example of the future we are living in now and try and replay that situation. Um, first, I just want to say that, you know, uh, I'm obviously a, bit, a big materials fan, so <laughs> I don't look at this landscape here, this urban you know, snapshot, and think, oh my god, what have we done to the world? I think, wow, this is as exotic, as wonderful as a jungle. And we made it. And it's got a fantastic range of materials. In fact, you don't really have to spend very long pointing them out and you already realize that each one of those was a revolution in its time. Each one of those completely changed the way we lived, changed how we lived, and all of our kind of customs, our industry, our economy. And here we are. We live in this kind of this world that we've created. And I could pick any one of those materials and rewind history and see if we could somehow learn something from how we got to where we are today. And I was going to actually ask for an audience poll at this point. 
but I have, I'm not going to do that because I'm not good enough for that. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to pick glass because it seems innocuous and kind of obvious. So I'm just going to rewind history for you. So glass, where did it come from? The Egyptians got hold of glass early on. So this is like 5,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago. That is a pectoral of tut in Tutankhamun. Um, at the center, that's not a, a diamond, that's not a ruby, that's not an emerald, that's a piece of glass. So for them, glass had this incredible symbolic significance because they learned they could turn sand into this jewel-like material. They couldn't do it very well. They were unable to make actual physical objects out of it, but they could make tiny sort of fragments of it in a kind of decorative way. And not just that, but when they went into the desert to look for it, they found very pure parts of glass, which, w which were seemingly created in storms. And although lightning can create glass in the desert, it's called a fulgurite, when a lightning bolt hits a, a, um, a sand bank, which is mostly made of quartz, which is the ingredients of glass, it can turn it into glass. Um, this isn't a fulgurite. This is much older. This is probably 26 million years old, and is probably the impact of some meteorite into the earth into a desert, creating beautiful bits of glass, which they then collected. OK, fast forward to the Romans. Now, the Romans were the, really the first ones to kind of realize that although it's decorative and looked beautiful and could be jewel-like, you could actually make functional objects out of it. But it was very hard to get the engineering right. And they discovered that when you heat it up, it formed this globule-like liquid mass. And if you then, if you were then confident enough, you could then put a pipe into it and blow it so this is a blown glass goblet. And they had enough strength, these things, where they could create, for the first time, transparent vessels. So before this, all vessels, whether they for grain or for liquid, were opaque. So they were either made of clay, ceramics, or they were made from pewter, silver, gold, depending on how rich you were. Any, any one of those ways, you weren't going to see what was in it. Suddenly, the Romans come along, and you can see the liquid inside it you can see the color of the wine. This totally changes what they think about wine. It totally changes the kind of wine they make. It totally changes how it tastes, because as we now know, you do actually modify your, your um, experiences depending on what you see. Um, so you've got them making glasses. And, and by the way, they make windows for the first time, too. So before this, windows don't exist. And basically, everyone has kind of windy <laughs> a windy time of it. Um, in fact, the word window means wind eye. Um, and of course, you know, so these things are great. As, as you fast forward, at least in the European sphere, um, people get better and better at making the glass. They get more elaborate at making the glass. And they, and they start to enamel it. They can etch it with acids. They can just really, they become absolute experts at it. And you think, well, OK, fine. I like a glass of wine. Who cares? This is not really going to change the world. And all, all right, so I like buildings that don't let the wind and the rain in. Well done, glass. You know, but how revolutionary is this material, really? Well, it changes the way that people worship. Because before this, you can't really make a massive building that is at all inspiring, because it can only be lit by candles or oil lamps. And actually, you can't see the ceiling, so it might as well not be there. When you have glass, suddenly you can make these glass cathedrals. And these are unique to Europe because Glass, like in the East, they didn't have glass until the 19th, 20th century, so they, you know, have, they went down a completely different route. Then the people who can make the glass start realizing they can do a lens action, so it actually can help you. So I don't know how many of you have got problems with your sight, but if basically all of you by the age of 50 are going to be long sighted to some extent or not, and I was born short sighted, so uh, my, my whole world would have been blurry from the start and was for lots of our ancestors. And certainly as they got older, they became unable to read or to see properly. So this changed old age. It changed actually scholarship, because then you could read for longer. And the people who knew knowledge and knew scholarship could, could, could maintain their relationship with the books. Once you've got a lens, someone has the idea of putting two of them together. You get, you get a telescope. And a telescope magnifies the heavens. And for the first time, you can prove that it isn't the Earth that goes around the sun. Oh, it is the Earth. No, that's right. Just checking. Um, <laughs> it's the afternoon. Um, it's, it's not the sun that goes around the Earth, but it's the Earth that goes around the sun. Now, there's no 
it's no, it's, you know, and you can do measurements, and you can find moons on Jupiter, and this is what Galileo did. So this changes, again, everything. In fact, you can't really have um, astronomy to any accuracy without a telescope. And it's kind of interesting to think what would happen if we hadn't got this material. And how did it make it into our lives? Not because people thought, oh, I've got, seen some glass in the desert, I'll make a telescope. It takes hundreds of years, thousands of years, actually, to get to that point. It needs a certain set of people who value the material and are skilled at the material, who perhaps only liked it for its aesthetic qualities before, but now it's become into its own. It starts to affect physics and science and invents a new science, right? And then, of course, the microscope. Now biology becomes possible. Invents the TIS tube. Without this, chemistry essentially isn't possible. Go to any chemistry lab you like. It's full of glass. Why? It's the, it's the perfect material to do experiments. You can see what happens. You can see color changes. You can see when precipitates form. Um, and to this day, right, without glass, chemistry comes to a shuddering halt. So, so this one material has a widespread impact, just you know, willy-nilly. And it's very, it would have, been, would have been impossible, really, to have thought that that was going to happen doesn't just change the sciences, it changes beer. Because as soon as glass becomes cheap enough to mass produce for taverns, whereas before, if you, and still these days often, you, you'll see these tankards hanging up. They're either made of pewter or they're made of you know, ceramic. If you go to, go to the Oktoberfest, you'll see lots and lots of them. That's the history of drinking beer, is not to see the drink itself. And most beers were cloudy and dark and tasted fantastic. This, beer, this glass comes along, starts to be served in taverns. People see how cloudy and murky their beer is. They demand a, a, a more beautiful beer. Ten years later, lager is born. Right? So in the same place in, in Bohemia, in Czechoslovakia. And we are then having to drink stuff that we can see through glass. Of course, the irony is that most lager gets drunk out of opaque vessels these days in the form of a can. So the one attribute that it's actually designed for is obscured, but anyway. Um, of course, what would modern cities be like, not just without wind coming through the wind eyes, but actually changing architecture itself by making huge sheets of the stuff? And, and the modern city is sort of unrecognizable. It's a palace to glass. It's, it, it fetishizes the glass window. People even put it inside. Go to any modern office development. You can't have an office with a door that's opaque anymore. It's impossible. You try and ask those architects to have one. Oh, you won't want that. You want people to see you inside working. No, we don't. We're academics. We want to be ferreting away and no one know we're in there. No, you're having a glass door. Anyway, it's just everywhere. It's my pet peeve. But still, the point is that this thing has an effect, has an effect on what you work, how you work, where you work, on architecture, on, on aesthetics, everything. Even the moving pictures. Of course, there's the lenses and the cameras, but for special effects become possible. Jaws is glass fiber. So it's a composite material, fibers of glass in a resin. So you have this amazing material that's the best of both worlds. You can make these incredible models like Jaws. Very realistic, I still think, if you watch it today. And of course, once you have people mucking about with fibers of glass, they realize that actually light doesn't travel down straight lines, as you previously thought, but can go around corners. And that opens the door to lasers turning your telephone conversations into pulses, and all data is now sent down glass. So your fiber optic whizzy you know, stuff you buy off BT or whoever you buy it from Sky, that's all due to glass. Without glass, you're not going to get fast broadband. In fact, it, doesn't, it won't exist without it. And of course, optical computers are coming. Optical computers are going to really, really transform the speed of the computational devices. They're not here yet, but already we've seen the effects of glass on, on data. And it still hasn't stopped. What's incredible is that this is a piece of glass which probably will affect all of your lives at some point in the near future. And it doesn't even look, it's not even developed for its optical qualities now. This is a I mean, what makes a glass, it's, it's an amorphous solid, and that often makes it opaque, uh, makes it transparent, but in this case, this is called bioglass, and its claim to fame is that it's inert in your body, so the body doesn't reject it. In fact, the surfaces are chemically altered so that when stem cells sit on it, they turn into bone cells. So you get a stem cell, it comes up to this material, it thinks, oh my god, I like to live here, it's got the right shape for me. Then, that is actually what they, they think. <laughs> um, and then they turn into a bone cell. And as they grow into bone, they eat their way through this material, which is porous. You can't really see it in this picture. 
they eat into it and they leave bone behind, which then becomes your cheekbone or your hip bone. So these are already in practice being used um, in, in modern medicine today. And, and, and you know, metal, metallic implants are likely not to be the thing of the future because they're the wrong stiffness. And actually, who wants an implant when you can have your own bone back? So, wow, glass has really done a lot for us. <laughs> and I wanted to show you an amazing piece of glass that really probably deserves, if any piece of glass deserves to be in a, in a future fest, this is it. It's a material without really a use. Um, oh, yeah, there it is. OK. It has got a use. NASA use it, and architects try and use it. NASA use it to collect space dust. And this is a piece of glass, but it's also the lightest solid around, and it's called aerogel. And it, it, it's weird because it doesn't seem to exist. It's transparent, but it, it, it's 99.8% air. So where it begins and the air ends is not clear. And um, it's a foam of glass again. It's one of these foams of glass. And it's, it's perfect for, for, for space exploration. It's the best insulator on the planet. It's, um, it, it's used to collect dust in space because it, when dust hits it, it hardly alters it in any way chemically or in terms of heat treatment. So, so it's used to collect space dust by NASA. But it's also looking for a terrestrial use, and no one can quite find one for it. It's sort of too good. It's too, when people used it for fabric to, to insulate clothes and they took it to the Arctic, people were too hot with this stuff. So it's kind of an amazing, you know, you, you'd like to predict what it's going to be for, but you, you, you'll struggle. So glass, and I put up there, um, you know, some of the kind of things that we've kind of created with glass. And, and the, the, the only thing I want you to take away from that strange diagram is that all glass roughly looks the same. And that's what's so mysterious about it, is that it's transparent, but inside are all these different structures. So that, that line down there is just a way of zooming into the material. You go from 1,000 millimeters to 10 millimeters to 0.1 of a millimeter. And at each time you go down one of those scales inside the piece of glass, any piece of glass, you come across these different structures. And what our ancestors were doing, even though they didn't have this language, is they were modifying different structures to create different things. So I was talking about you know, transparency and color. Well, that's actually down at the atomic scale. You have to muck about with the chemistry and the quantum mechanics. They didn't, didn't have those languages, but they knew how to do it. This is incredible. Um, if you want to make, you want to make enormous sheets of glass, which we now live with and are both wonderful and annoying, it turns out that you have to deal with the top bit, the strength. The strength actually is in, in, the, in, the, in the quite large defects that normally inhabit glass. So the strength of glass is not determined by its atomic structure at all, which is a big surprise, but it's true. It's determined by the largest flaw. And actually making glass with hardly any flaws in it, right, sub-microscopic flaws, is what those big panes of glass are all about. And before, when you're making glass, you had to pour it onto a flat surface. I haven't got very much time. And um, you had to, of course, it would solidify onto that surface. Now, whatever flaws are on that surface, and it doesn't matter how flat that surface is, it's going to have flaws, would then determine the strength of that glass. So panes of glass were always small until recently. So how do you get around it? You have to pour it onto something that is atomically smooth. What's atomically smooth? Liquids. So we pour it onto liquid tin. Enormous rivers of liquid tin the size of this room, much bigger than this room. <laughs> glass is poured onto it. You can have a pane of glass the size of this room. It's incredible to think. And it can have enough strength to, su to support its own weight because of this knowledge. So this microscopic understanding of the world, this is new. And it has come about because of glass microscopes and, therefore, and then electron microscopes that have come before. So all of these materials, all of these materials are due an update due to this new knowledge. And that's really what I want to say about the future, which is that the future actually is, is about what you can't see. It's the understanding of what you can't see, but then it, it comes into your life, into these amazing materials. They, 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 beha they behave like magic, but actually it's these microstructural features that are what give it this power. And I don't have much time to talk about it, but I, I want to just give you an example. So this, what if you wanted a building that changed color? Now, OK, you might want that just because you like buildings that change color. I happen to think I'd like to live in one. 
Um, imagine the autumn, right? It would change, and then in the winter it would get darker, and then in the summer it would suddenly become spring-like. Wouldn't that be great? A whole row of houses changing color. All right, I like it anyway. But it has an environmental uh, effect too. If your house goes white, it will reflect more heat. So you need less cooling. If your house goes dark, it will absorb more heat from the sun, and it needs less warming. So actually, you can do two things at once here. You can, you can actually passively heat or cool your house selectively by creating a shape, uh, a color-changing brick or concrete. And here it is. We made it in our lab. <laughs> and it's, it's magic, really. So this is the sun. Then uh, it just changes color <laughs> and goes white. I mean, admittedly, it's going from light blue to white. I know that doesn't sound very amazing, but what what... What we're doing is we're manipulating these different scales down here. We're creating different structures inside the brick that they respond to, not heat in this case, but, 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 but sunlight or whatever you want. So, so what, what opens up before us is a whole plethora of opportunities. So you can change buildings, color, or you can make them self-healing. So here is a piece of self-healing concrete. And this works, amazingly enough. So if you crack this concrete, it will restore 90% of its strength itself by healing itself. And the way it does it is, again, by basically taking advantage of different scales. So this, in this case, it's a microscopic bacteria that's embedded inside the concrete, which can survive the alkaline environment. And they found these in these kind of weird uh, sort of places in the world, which have these kind of bubbling places where they thought nothing could ever live, and actually they find bacteria in there. Anyway, it can also live in concrete, but it's dormant until um, the humidity goes up above a certain amount. So if it's just cracked, it exposes the bacteria to this humidity, it wakes up. It looks around for food, which has been cunningly put there by the concrete makers in the form of starch. It eats the starch and excretes. <laughs> calcite, a major constituent of concrete. So it eats its way out of the crack, at the same time blocking it up with one of the major constituents of concrete. Pretty impressive, I think you'll find. And it seems to me that there is no end to this. I'm not going to keep going. I've got a, bag. I've got a box full of chicks. I've run out of time. But what I want to say is this, that, that our power to change the world has, has never been greater. And I think as the glass example shows, it's actually virtually impossible to predict which are the bets that are going to take you in which directions. Like glass is a really good example. I could have chosen loads of others. So what takes us forward then? Why? You know, why should we go down some routes? Should we go down the self-healing concrete route? Should we go down the thermochromic brick route? You know, these are questions that we have to resolve. But you could never be care you'll never be able to predict which one will be beneficial for society or which one will have the most impact in science, or which one will have the most impact in economics or manufacturing. You'll never, ever be able to predict it, because the world is just too complicated and wonderful. And that really is kind of a good thing, I think. Um, but one thing is for sure, the only prediction I think I will make is that the world is going to get more complicated, because it's going to have more wonderful materials in it, which we're going to make. And I'm looking forward to that. Thank you for listening.